We'll go ahead and call our meeting back to order. We're going to change things up a little bit for schedules if, uh, if everybody's agreeable. We'd like to uh, have Rear Admiral Herring, USN retired, uh, from the Center for Climate and Security join us. Rear Admiral uh, Landert Len Herring, Sr., is a member of the Center for Climate and Security's Advisory Board, a native of Portsmouth, New, uh, Virginia. He retired from the Navy in 2009 after serving with distinction for over 32 years. A surface warrior by trade, he rose to become a prominent military and civilian sustainability leader with a broad background in base operations, facility uh, support, energy, and environmental issues. His passion in sustainability lies in educating people on the dangers the future holds without taking responsible actions to address climate change, securing our nation's energy independence, and preserving access to clean water, air quality, and other resources. We'd like to welcome you here today. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. This is going to be a little bit different, and hopefully, um, now that you've all had lunch, um, you won't fall asleep, um, and if you do, I don't want you to have nightmares over what I'm about to tell you, because um, I, w I was asked to present um, a position that was predominantly um, focused on agriculture and food. Um, and I tried to do that um, in the last couple days, and I realized that in order to do that, um, I would be disingenuous um, in presenting such a narrow-focused picture on what it is that you as a body um, from an agriculture and food perspective need to understand in making decisions, not only for the state of California, but more from a global sense. Because what I'm talking about here is um, the issues that are necessary for us to be able to have an adult conversation about what's happening um, in a global sense and why it's important for all of us. And I can tell you that, um, I will tell you just as an example, because the, the, the things came up, um, the reason the Iranians are using salt water to, um, to irrigate their pistachios is because the four major lakes in Iran are dry, um, as are the eight major lakes in the Middle East because they've tried to turn desert into irrigation and now have no other source of water. Um, and they are in their 17th year of significant drought. Um, so the issues are, 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 are really big, um, and the markets will change. Um, and the way we address them is important. So I'm going to go through a three-hour presentation in about 15 <laughs> minutes. But every one of us need to have a reason um, for sustainability. And mine used to be defense of the country. Now it's my grandchildren. Because I really do believe that if we're not more careful in what we're doing, um, the prosperity and opportunities that I have lived with and afforded and created um, a sensation for um, even giving my life for um, will not be the same for them if we are not better stewards of what it is that we're about to face. And we have to ask the question, just how sustainable are we? And looking across the board, um, for those of you who have traveled outside of the United States, you recognize that 70% um, of the world doesn't live like us. But yet they all want to look, feel, play, and live exactly the same way we do. But for the last 250 years, only 13 nations have enjoyed the luxury of being what's called Western industrialized. And the non-industrialized world is moving at a rate six times faster than we did in 250 years. And virtually every Chinese child today is looking to have an iPod in their pocket tomorrow. That's the aspect. And when you really understand from a sustainable perspective, those 13 nations dominated and still today control 70% of the world's resources that are necessary to be able to support the lifestyle in which we become accustomed. So what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, you have to understand, hey, uh, we've been here a very, very short period of time. Um, in the total scale of a year, if you were to take the beginning of creation um, to today, 365 days, we've been here a total of 14 seconds. So our impact on the face of the earth and the extent in which man has had an impact on the face of the earth is huge. And more importantly, the greatest impact that we have had began in 1850. So from the time of Homo sapien beginning to now, to 1850, it took us that long to get from 2 to 1.5 billion. And we're going to go through the process because this has consequences for the immediate future. And why is it so important? Well, first and foremost, 
we are in unprecedented territory. Man has been around for roughly 260,000 years. For the past 650,000 years, parts per million in our atmosphere has never been above 300. Today, we are closing on 420. Unprecedented territory, and again, the exponential rate of that carbon emission and the greenhouse gases found in our atmosphere began truly right around that same time frame, 1850, the introduction of the carbon-based industry. Um, we've known about it since 1853, Moyer's Law, um, and it has been going on ever since that point. But we are right now in unprecedented territory. And when people tell you that it really doesn't make any difference, that the Earth has been there before, who gives a hoot? Mammal has not been around in that time frame. So above 300 parts per million and now 400 parts per million is critical to understanding. And oh, by the way, I'm a meteorologist and oceanographer and a climatologist by study. So I do understand the science and physics associated with this as well. And we have to look at each part because everything that we have on the globe is all interconnected. And you may ask, why the ocean? Well, the ocean is in such desperate straits. We virtually fished it out. We are in terrible state of where we are and what's happening on a global scale. As a matter of fact, this says 20%. We're closer to 40% of the world's coral reefs are disappearing. And as sea level rise is introduced, even more will disappear. The bleaching that's occurring in our oceans and the catastrophe that we've caused as a result of our interaction with the oceans are significant. But more importantly, in the world, especially in the Pacific Rim, 70% of their protein comes from the ocean. So as the food dynamic changes in the most populated region of the world, where does that food source come from? And what do we do when you take a look at what we've done over the course, and what conflict does that bring? Well, the next piece you have to look at is population. And population, we are in our fifth round of doubling. Again, from the time of creation to 1850, it took us that long to get to 1.5 billion. From 1850 today, we went from 1.5 to 7.4. In the next 40 years, folks, we are going to add another 2.4 to 2.7 billion people to the face of the earth. And the unfortunate part of this is it's not in the industrialized world. It is in the developing world. Those portions of our globe that are least capable of handling the, in, the geographical instability that this growth will cause. And that number equates to adding an India and a China to the face of the earth today in the next 40 years. Okay? So never mind what you talked about in market share, because the numbers are changing so fast. But what's really not part of that equation is the geopolitical instability that markets will suffer as a result of these types of issues. Then you've got to take a look at the food supply. What is it? Where is it? For those of you who have traveled around the world and you've seen poverty, you know that it is in America. It's not America. And poverty around the world is incredible. But we here in America, we're the most wasteful. 40% of everything you're talking about, we throw out. And worse than, worse than that is we throw out more food every day than the co entire continent of Europe consumes. And that was used for the study because Europe is not a deprived continent. They're part of the wealthy nations. But we throw out more food every day that we grow, then they consume. And this is growing. World hunger is at a peak. And this is before we add another 2.4 to 2.7 billion people to the face of the earth. In the next 40 years, man will have to produce more food than he has in the past 10,000 to feed those same bodies. Say that again. In the next 40 years, man will have to produce more food than he has in the past 10,000 to feed what's on the globe. 
And then we have to get to the other consequence because food, in that reality, folks, we can go 30 days. I've gone 22 days in ration without food. Um, not a good experience. But I can tell you that the people in that picture that I showed you before, many of those have gone long beyond that 22-day period. But the one item that we can't do without is water. And the globe is, in fact, stealing its treasury. If you think the American budget is in bad shape, in deficit, the global deficit that we are creating in the fresh water on a global scale is catastrophic. And I hope that no one sitting at this table believes that California is out of the drought. Because we are not. From a climatological perspective, we are in our 17th year of climatological drought. And one good year only makes up for one third of the previous six years. For every year, you must have three years of normal to recover from that one year of drought, and we are in our 17th year of climatological drought. And what's worse is we're counting on snowpack that's melting at five times the rate that it should be melting at because of climate change. The glacial ice in the northern 48 is now forecast to be gone in the next 17 years. So if you've not touched the glacier on the top of Mount Rainier, quick, it's going to be gone. And it's 12 million year old ice. But we have to figure out how to do this differently. Because so much of the world's population lives in some of the most deprived portions of our globe in which water is, in fact, a problem. And again, the Middle East is a perfect example. If you've not seen the National Geographic article that was printed just two months ago, I think, there's an incredible article about the five largest lakes of the world that are today gone because of climate change and man's abuse in its use. So we have to figure out. It's bad and it's going to get worse. As climate changes, so too are the things that are impacting it. This is Folsom Lake, so I don't need to tell you that in 2011, we started talking about conservation in 2014. It's dry, and it's been dry every single year past. And just because we fill our reservoirs doesn't mean we've done any good. That just means more water that falls goes faster into the ocean because it doesn't get to our aquifers, which I've heard far too many people say, it's great, it's falling on the land, it'll get there. Less than 2% of the world's water that falls onto land ever makes it to the aquifer. The cycle is good. We've got plenty of water. This is not where it needed. And we've got to figure out, because this is happening on a global scale. In, t in 2011, or in 2014, 10,000 animals were left to die in Australia because of the plight. The 12th largest city is now looking at the first time in mankind's history. This is Sao Paulo, Brazil. And if you don't believe that geopolitical instability can result from this, this was the principal cause for the call for the coup that, it, that potentially was going to happen in Brazil. But they are looking at depopulating eight and a half million people from the city of Sao Paulo, primarily because they don't have water. From conservation measures and pollution, they have gotten to a state in which they cannot sustain life in the city of Sao Paulo. And of course, the least people who are able to adopt and adapt are the poorest. And we're as wasteful as we get. And I don't need to tell you that here in America, you know, the average shower is 13 minutes. There are many people around the world who have never had a shower in their life. But 20% of California's energy, uh, energy is used to move um, that potable water, which 40% of it goes down the drain. And you know that a very large portion of that water is used for agriculture as well, um, including irrigation for um, processes that are just flood um, and not the smartest way to do business. But we've got to figure out how to get there from here. And then you've got to talk about climate and not weather change because they are not the same. Um, climate is a long term. Weather is the day-to-day -day interaction of air masses. And air masses form what we have on a collision basis between air masses form weather. And the climate, though, is something we look at decadal. And the climate across the board <coughs> is changing 10 times faster than it has in the past 65 million years. 
Last year was a banner year for any meteorologist who has studied low pressure centers. And when I was a student, my professor who became the head of the Miami Hurricane Center told me in class that there was no possible way that there would be enough energy in the Atlantic stream to support more than one Category 5 storm. Last year, there were five storms on the same track in the same day, three of them Category 5. And if you can only imagine the mass energy it took to do that, that's climate change. That's climate change, because the only way that can happen is the heating of the atmosphere and the creation that's being, that's being done um, as a result. So what does it do? Well, first and foremost, it has extreme weather conditions all over the globe. So we're talking about the impacts of what these things will have. And if you think that what happened in Houston could not happen someplace else, but more importantly, what it could do to entire economies. Let's talk about the Philippines. 1,800 inhabited islands with the average height above sea level just five feet. A 13-inch rise in sea level, and that's an extremely modest expectation for the next 50 years. A Category 2 storm puts 12.4 million people in the ocean. Last year, they missed it by just 40 miles. And again, sea level rise and its effect, it's everywhere. It's happening at an unprecedented rate. And if you've not seen the movie 30 Million, I suggest you do so. It is a movie made by the Bangladeshi government to show the plight of what sea level rise is doing to the most densely populated, least capable portion of the world. And how, how it's all working. I'm going to skip through this stuff because it's not that important. But we also have to understand that in some cases, this could be as much as 23 feet if H++ actually becomes the reality. I'm not advocating for that, but that's exactly what it is. If all the glacial ice on the face of the Earth melt, then we're looking at 13 to 23 feet. Sea level population rise, we're looking at potentially 100 million people on a global scale displaced. And that's only with a 44 centimeter increase, 17 inches. So there's lots of opportunity for us to do things, but we need to figure out how to get there. This is the pitch and no joke, the renewable solution for the reduction of greenhouse gases is there. But we need to figure out some of the other aspects um, because every bit of this is important to us moving forward. And I'm gonna get to the last part of this, why this is so important again. Sam Locklear, who is a great friend of mine, um, Sam was the regional command or was the commander of the Pacific Theater, um, and Sam is the first flag officer in American history who testified in front of the Congress to say that climate change is the biggest long-term security threat to the United States and the globe in the Pacific region, except North Korea, and we know how to deal with North Korea. But if you've not seen the consequences of what's happening and why it's so important that we keep in mind the dynamics of what's happening and why this is important, you need to understand how markets can change virtually overnight, but more importantly, how aspects of what I'm speaking of today, example water, 30% of China gets its water from the Himalayas. When the Himalayas disappear, and they are melting at a, tw at a rate 20 times faster than normal, the most densely populated portion of the world will be without its principal source of water. That's clear and simple. And the lakes that they've created will not last forever. Because even the rain that they get is not enough to provide even the basics that are necessary. If you've not seen this movie, I suggest you do so because it is a movie that is dedicated primarily towards the refugee problem on a global scale caused by climate change and the fear that climate change has within the demographics of a country as those necessary resources 
no longer are part of their daily life. So it's important to understand water litigation in the state of Texas is, eight, is up 800% in the last five years. And remember, the Hoover Dam started with a armed rebellion between California and Arizona. Um, and those type of litigations on a nationwide spectrum are bound to cause geopolitical instability across the globe when 54,000 people a day across the globe find refuge from the, from the issues associated with climate change. And if I'm not in uniform anymore so I can say it, the Syrian conflict, the civil war in Syria, is due almost in its entirety to climate change. Syria is in its 19th year of significant drought. Syria was the breadbasket of the Middle East and has been since the time of Christ. But for 19 consecutive years, it has gotten zero water. 3.2 million farmers are without livelihood. The breadbasket of the Middle East is now a huge desert. And the government has no idea how to deal with the problem, hence civil war. And it has spread throughout the rest of the region and has now created an even bigger catastrophe because all of the rest of the world is dealing with this crisis of more than 54,000 of these people a day seeking refuge. They're all over the place. And they're going to get worse. If you did not follow the election in Hungary, I suggest you go back and listen to the speech of the president who won the election. It reeks of 1939. Protectionism, nationalism, preservation of a typical type of individual as a resultant of what is now the migration problem into Europe caused by these very problems. This is the movie 30 million. And the really amazing part is there's actually two minutes at the very end where the young, uh, about a seven year old boy who's been displaced, displaced three times in his life says on the camera, I, I do not understand why I am the victim of your prosperity. And that's what the plea is, is understand that while your prosperity may be good, you are destroying those who have not. And it really is an issue. But if you can see and understand, when these 30 million plus from Bangladesh, and it's already happening today, none of these surrounding countries want the, 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 the migration problem that is now existing. As a matter of fact, on the Indian border, the Indian army has permission to shoot, to kill, to prevent this migration problem from becoming their problem. They already have enough. I mean, they have, they have seven times the population that we have. And oh, by the way, 300 million of them have never seen fresh potable water. That's the population of the United States. And it's everywhere. So the consequences of very, every bit of this, again, while this doesn't seem like a big deal for the agriculture, if you think the Chinese are not making a play for the islands in the Pacific that they haven't given a hoot about for nearly 200 years, because of what's happened in the North China Sea, they have virtually fished the North China Sea out. And with the domination and with the proclamation of land comes the economic free zone that will exist for the Chinese to control the fisheries of the South China Sea. It has nothing to do with all the rest of the stuff. It has everything to do with these issues. They are the bottom line. And again, as this is displaced, where does this food source and protein come from in an ever exploding population in this region? Philippines, again, huge problems. 
But we have to understand that there are reports out here that have been out. This report's been out since 1970. <coughs> These things, we have done many reports and provide opportunities for people. I, su I suggest you go to the Center for Climate um, and Security. The reports are here. We put one out every single year. But on, in these in particular, these are very, very important because they are predominantly written by individuals who have been in this place and have spent most of our time doing the strategic planning necessary to maintain our security on a global scale. And these aspects are huge. And these are considerations that we must be able to make if we are to be successful and understand that everything that you're doing here today is exactly what we need to have done, but we need to make absolutely certain that the considerations going forward include the dynamics of what eventually will occur as these unfold. There's, these are not things that we can stop. So I leave you with this last piece, and that is that if you look to the right side and left side of the chart in the middle, the undeveloped nations control virtually 70%, and you can see where the developing nations, in order for them to have nearly the same prosperity that we have, would have to shift the dynamics um, of controls, and that's from a resource perspective. But the 20th century was the bloodiest century in mankind's history. More than 60 million in uniform and 120 million civilian casualties were a result of 13 nations who virtually for the better part of an entire century fought for the control of the resources nece necessary to be industrialized. As the rest of the world unfolds, what does the 21st century have in store for us? Because again, China is nine times our population. India, six and a half times, or seven and a half times. They are not part of that 13 nation 20th century, not by a long stretch. But yet they are, as you have indicated and alluded to today, a huge part of what you consider to be the economic prosperity of the globe. Because what they are doing is in fact shifting the balance of what this is all about. And I can only leave you with this last piece again. The 20th century was the bloodiest century. My son today is serving in the Navy. He was a senior chief in the submarine service, and we're very, very proud of him. He's had 18 years of service. Every single day of my son's service, this nation's been at war. Every single day. So again, when you look at the next step, is this what I can gift to my grandchildren for my service and my son's service with an expectation that my grandchildren will be in the same situation, but as things unfold, it could be significantly different. So I'm really to say that, you know, we have an opportunity. Um, I've been characterized sometimes as the apocalyptic head, but I was also <coughs> advised by my Hebrew friend that apocalypse in Hebrew really means new beginning. Um, so I leave you with this, and again, I'm a religious, very religious in my, in my beliefs, and I do believe that he's given us domination, uh, but that domination is for the preservation of the gift he's given us, not its destruction for our own personal purposes. And we're doing a terrible job of preserving that gift but the one thing that he did give us, different from all of the other species that, he's, that he has made, is he gave us opposing thumbs and intellect. We need to use that intellect for a different form than what we, are, we have in the past. And it's not for self-preservation, it's for species preservation, because I can tell you that if we do reach four degrees, 4.5 degrees centigrade, which is now the new forecast, um, Mankind will cease to exist. Um, so we could, you know, for all practical purposes, let me tell you, at 420 parts per million, the human brain suffers from its cognitive capacity 
that is, makes us different from the primate. And if you ask an anesthesiologist, he will tell you that he increases the amount of carbon monoxide into the, the air mixture at roughly 440 to 450 parts per million before he gives you the big stuff. Because your brain begins to shut down at that level. And man does not have enough time left to evolve that will allow us to adapt to an environment that provides for this. So it isn't, it isn't an if, it's a we have to figure out how to get there from here. We've got to figure out how to do this differently. We have to have a different conversation. And hopefully um, this alerts you to some of the things that potentially from your decisions, um, there are things that are made that both preserve um, and up, can be applied so that the solution is not sole, but more species oriented. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and we'll go ahead and open this up for comments, questions. Nancy? Wow. Well, thank you for being here today. Um, when you talk about the rate of change and the accelerating rate of change and the considerations that we need to be making our decisions uh, modern, you might say, uh, what kind of time scale are you, are you really... I, I wish, you. Nancy, I know, I know that we've talked about some of this before, but I wish that were, were possible, that we could basically say, here it is. Uh, I think the biggest problem that we are experiencing from a scientific perspective is that all of our models that we've used and we've relied upon in the past are no longer working properly. <coughs> and in some cases, it's because the variables that were utilized to establish those models are no longer holding true. Um, and what, what it's in science, it's called the positive feedback loop in our environment. That positive feedback loop is something that, while it sounds great, positive, feedback, good, no, not good. Um, it is an uncontrolled, undeterminable amount of release that is occurring because we can't calculate how fast the Earth stored or now is releasing as it changes its dynamic. So we never envisioned, even in the best days, that portions, 250,000 square miles of our oceans are at, are, are at saturation level. Nobody would have ever thought that our ocean could reach its saturation, and you can't add any more than 100%. But it is these huge, when you hear red and black, mole, red and black algae uh, bursts, you know, algae lives in carbon dioxide. And when you see hundreds of miles of ocean front explode in black algae, it's because that portion of the ocean is dead. It is at 100% saturation. And what needs oxygen can't live in that environment. So how fast does it go? I don't know. The glaciers are melting. Um, our tundra is melting faster. If you want to really experience, in America at least, climate change, go to Alaska. That's where you're going to experience it, because what's cold is going to get colder. What's wet is going to get wetter. What's dry is going to get drier. And we're going to have abnormal weather conditions across the board. But the tundra in the northern Arctic along the 23rd divide is melting at a rate unprecedented to anything recorded in history. I don't know. Hopefully we can get our stuff in one sock fast enough to recognize that we can't go through this process um, in the same fashion that we've done it in the past. It's got to be faster. Over what period of time have we gone from 350 to 420 parts? From 350 to 400? Um, we were forecast to be at 300 parts per million in 1976 or 1977. Um, we actually got there about 12 years sooner um, than what was it forecast. Um, the forecasts that have been made even to the 450 mark um, are today still under evaluation because there are four different models that are being utilized to project that. But they are being monitored across the globe in 12 different sites. Um, the one we use is the one that's in, in Hawaii, um, and it is the one that recorded the first 400 on the 13th of October, 2013. Um, so we're seeing a global, a, a global increase. The projections for what can be um, 
I mean, 450, hopefully we can slow it down. Um, but again, we're, clo we're closing on 420. And that was not supposed to be till 2035, 2040, around that time frame. And we're closing on it today. So um, the sense of urgency is very clear from your presentation. So it makes you wonder, so is there anything that we can do? Um, obviously, we need to move fast to decarbonize our economies. But no doubt about that. But there has been, and I was talking about this at lunchtime, just in the last four years, and then the last year especially, um, a new emphasis on landscapes, land management, our land practices, and the opportunities to improve the sequestration of carbon as another way of offsetting what's going on. So I'm wondering if, if you have some experience on that or if you believe it's just, you know, kind of a Hail Mary. We hope it could be even halfway true if you've got some thoughts on that to share with us. In, in actuality, it, it is the reason why I believe that intellect will help to solve the problem. The problem that we have, though, today is that too many of the sciences are, are stovepiped. Um, and we need to understand the second and third order consequences of every action that we take. Um, and I think that that's one of, probably one of the, the, the most difficult parts to have this conversation because every time you think you've found a solution, you understand that there's a second or a third order of consequence associated with that decision that has as much, if not more, impact. Um, and, but yet it's not considered in the same fashion. Um, you know, if, if I had the keys to the castle um, and had the opportunity to do this, I would bring the most brilliant minds together in a Manhattan Project series um, to solve the problems that are necessary in the multidisciplines. But we can't solve it with energy alone. Energy is only 22 to 23 percent of our greenhouse gas problem. Agriculture and, and industry is a larger percentage. Um, but we do need to understand how that equates across the board and what are the consequences. Um, you know, we, I have many conversations, especially with the overpopulation piece, and that's the last thing we want to talk about in a, in a forum. I just got back from Trinity University, and one of the questions was, okay, so what about, and it's like, look, I'm not telling you what the solution is. I'm just telling you these are the numbers. Um, and China tried it for three decades, and now there's a, um, there's a genealogist in England who just released an interesting study that potentially because of that single action, that there is a very good probability that the Chinese, no joke, pure Chinese race could disappear in the next 30 years because they have eliminated their female population to such an extent that there are not enough females to breed with the pure male and their only way to procreate is to find something external which will completely water down the process. But they are now in a glut of pure Chinese females. So you can have that conversation. Is it, you know, it, does it, does it lend abortion? To, 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 it, it, I, I'm not telling you that's the right situation. Again, second and third order consequences. If you cut down on the amount of water to produce broccoli is one of the high water using, you know, maybe you get to a point where you start figuring out how to get there from here. I've had plenty of conversations with individuals who say it's the dairy and beef industry. Uh, yeah, I got it. Um, I got it. But how do you replace that protein? Um, what do you do with all the rest of the stuff? Because, again, you can't make this decision tomorrow and cause the entire culture to change. So if I were to ban beef tomorrow, I guarantee you there would be a black market that would be double what we saw in the Prohibition era. So you, you have to understand that there's a second and third order consequence. But I think that what we need to do is bring all of the disciplines together so that we understand how to make that transformation more informed. And I think that, um, again, if we approach it in that fashion, I would use the ASU model. Are you familiar with ASU? Um, Michael Crow built the new research center at ASU, and I, I marvel at what he did as a, as a president. But he brought all nine of the science, science disciplines into one building. And, and they have made such miraculous it, it, it just miraculous experimental finds in that university because all nine disciplines who used to do their own work are now having to work next to each other. And that's what we need in this same process. Seven countries were this close to developing the nuclear bomb. 
Imagine if we brought all 13 of the nations together to solve this problem together. And they did it in just over a year. We do have the capacity, the technology, and the scientific know-how to manipulate the largest molecule on the periodic table. Um, so thank you so much for um, those very sobering uh, remarks, but really important, so thank you. Um, I, I still come back to a question, though, for you that's really kind of following up um, on the Secretary's question. Is this actually a skill problem or is this a will problem? Um, you, you say on the one hand that we've got to have a Manhattan Project and we've got to bring folks together to figure out what we're going to do. Even if we develop the technological solution, don't we still have another challenge in front of us? And could you give us some insights or thoughts um, coming from one of the most, you know, the largest and most effective uh, bureaucracies on the planet? Uh, if you have any thoughts about what we should be doing. Yeah, and, on, and, and we've had lots of conversation about how to get there from here. And I think that um, in many cases, it's a conversation about how do we change um, the methodology in our decision-making process. Um, unfortunately, in the capitalistic society, we are driven to a profit margin that returns immediate benefit to the benefactor. Um, and that is, in most cases, from large corporations. The expectation is no greater than seven and a half. Um, in the worst cases, 17 and a half year. Um, I can tell you that this nation was not built on a 17 and a half year return investment. Um, and neither will the world of tomorrow. Um, so the expectation of what it is that you're talking about is what are the changes that we need to make as a whole? And I'm talking individually because I believe that it happens at an individual level. And I look at it this way. If I were to leave nothing to my children but spend every penny making absolutely certain that everything that I did benefited their future tomorrow, that would be the best gift that I could give them. And I don't expect that return to be seven and a half years. I expect that return to be generational. So the $100 billion to get from point A to point B isn't an addition to our deficit. It is a payment up forward, up front, to make absolutely certain that the generation that we have been left to charge, in fact, secures from our prosperity. And that, it's that, just that simple. We are not making those type of investments. Um, with the dissolution of the national laboratories and the likes, the most brilliant minds in America are now working for corporations who have a completely different agenda for how technology is brought to forefront. Well, we need to figure it out. And, we, and, and, I, and I say that a, a nation could do this, but we have to sit back and say, this is a species issue. We, we, there, is, there, are no, there are no rights and lefts to this group. It doesn't make any difference what color you are, what age you are, what demographic you come from. This is an issue that, again, that seven-year-old child in Bangladesh is why am I the victim of your prosperity? We have to come together and we have to make investments on a global scale that even if it were to the case where we became a nonprofit and the most brilliant minds work for nothing except home and whatever, um, again, you know, 163 some odd scientists for 17 months locked themselves in the desert for virtually nothing to create what was the prosperity of tomorrow. Unfortunately, it was used for the wrong good, but that's where we are. And I think that's what we have to do today. We've got to figure out how to make an investment that's not tied to 17 years in return. Um, and it's going to require a completely different approach. So, so, what are, so what are we doing right today? And where do you see as heading. I mean, I think there's been a lot of change. And, Huge uh, changes. There, ha there have been tremendous changes. Don't get me wrong. Um, there have been tremendous changes in my lifetime. California has set the standard um, for what's there. Before, I, before this past year, I was the executive director and president of the Center for Sustainable Energy in California. So, um, you know, I very much understand um, what California has done very hard politically fought battles um, on the floor to make sure that things like SB1 and others made it to the, made it to the table and then eventually the governor signs. Um, but I can tell you that that's not happening everywhere else. But at the same time, um, I see more and more 
and I'm making these, this presentation a little bigger scale, um, around the country um, where I'm invited to be able to do this. And it used to be that I would go into somebody's living room and there'd be six. Um, the last one I made at Trinity University at, the, uh, at the, the, uh, their climate conference um, in San Antonio, Texas. There were 3,500 people around the globe um, who logged in to witness what was there. Um, so I think there's a growing concern and there are people who are looking to mobilize so that we can bring some of the introduction. One of the biggest problems that America suffers is everything that, everything we do um, has to be built here. Um, and there have been people around the globe who have been doing this stuff for a lot longer. Um, and if you don't believe so, I visited Israel the first time in 1964, 1969, um, and then in 1977, got an opportunity to go back, and then in 1984 again, and then in 1985 again, and I can tell you that the, the difference between what I saw in the beginning and what I see today is exactly where we need to go. The Saudi Arabians have virtually decimated every lake that they own, but today, 94% of their fresh water comes from the sea, and next year, 60% of that will all be processed using renewable, and by 2020, all of it will be made through renewable. And we still haven't tapped into the resources that exist in the, literally, in the water cycle. Um, you know, San Diego is a perfect example. And I think that there are, people are really focusing on those, the, the battery technology. And I, and I would say, if one of our solutions has to be battery technology, and I don't care whether it's a farmer or whoever. I grew up on a farm, um, so in upstate New York, um, I, I raised 130 head of milkers. 1,600 chickens, and we farm 1,300 acres of uh, feed and fodder. Um, so I understand what it is, but I can also tell you that there was probably enough energy on that farm that I could have produced using the technology developed today that would not have caused my dad to go broke during the tough times of feed and fodder lack. And we see those industries breaking out um, in many cases in California um, where those industries are coming to fruition. The desalinization and the process of desalinization, 100% renewable. Um, we need to figure out how to get there from here. The biodiesel industry is a perfect example of a plus-plus. It's a sequestration tool as well as in an effort to create um, even the things that we, we wear and build and the likes. There are opportunities. And we, we've come a long way. Um, but I think that if there is hope, the hope for us as a whole rests in the developing world. And I say that because of my comments that I said over the return on investment. Um, when you have no infrastructure to battle, the adoption of new infrastructure for the production of new standards of living becomes simple. When you unplug an, an electric cord and install a solar panel, you now have the, res the, the solution for tomorrow and it won't be reliant on energy that is, that we're tied to. Um, same thing with the food sources and the likes. I mean, there are other ways to do business. Um, and I think that there are, there are ways. I've been working with Borrego Springs and trying to figure out how to fix some of their problems. Um, and in the same fashion, it was um, stop the citrus, stop this, stop that, do this. Okay, so what do you do with it then? Um, and when you realize that it's part of that huge economy you talked about, um, the consequences may be okay locally, but what do they do to the whole? And what happens when the condition changes um, so that we have to be able to adapt and be prepared to adapt? Because again, what's dry is going to get drier. What's wet is going to get wetter, cold, colder. It's the whole thing, and you have to understand that um, you know, what is in um, Mexico in just 10 years is going to be Southern California. That's the reality of climate change. Can you still stop? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, well, I have a question you know, about how the Navy is tackling this issue and the degree to which the Navy can have influence on our sort of political debate. I, I, you didn't mention, but you probably should. The Navy, I mean, in terms of recognizing climate change early on and changing the way it does business is probably, I, mean, I don't know, I don't know how to rank these things, but it's one of the most impressive yeah. sort of management challenges taken on. And I, I think 
decarbonizing the fuel of the fleet is not, I don't think you're there yet, but it's well within reason. And, and it, so anyway, I wanted, I just wanted to sort of acknowledge that and applaud you all for that, or you and your, your former, you know, okay. employer. Um, but I guess the, the, the second part of the question is, you know, about sort of about persuasion. I found, I find your, your, your presentation persuasive. I work for environmental defense fund. I'm sort of a, I'm, you know, you're preaching to the choir to a certain extent. Um, but there's a there's a phenomenon in, in in this country now where if you're from California you're sort of not listened to, and if you're from an environmental group, it's like yeah what what do you expect? But I take hope in the fact that the Navy you know has a different voice. They actually they must train you to be persuasive too because you know I sort of feel like when you talk I gotta I got I don't have a choice. Next time I call you to say right, I, gotta, really I don't have a choice. Um, so like w w where do we go with that? Is there are you finding others of your retired colleagues and, and even active duty colleagues that um, are 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 moving the needle because it doesn't feel like it's happening right now. I mean just based on what's happening in Washington right now. Yeah, it's it, and I can say that um, the Navy I was extremely proud of the Navy um, and where they were going. When I when I was taken out of the warfighting role and put into the base commander role. I was sent there because I have a business degree and a warfighting understanding. My job was to come to the Naval Base San Diego and create an environment that, from a business perspective, minimized the costs and allowed the dollar to be utilized to fight the war because we changed the budget cycle and how the war was being funded. So my job was to go in there. And well, I found out that the three largest cost centers in any business deal is you look for your largest cost centers, and those are the places you focus the most. Guess what? Energy, water, and trash. And the more I got involved in those three cost centers, the more I realized that we as a whole were incredibly wasteful of this phenomenal resource, and I called that resource the taxpayer's dollar. So my emphasis became minimizing those costs so that the taxpayer was advantaged by those efforts. Well, what I realized was it really led me to a more renewable stream. Um, and in so doing was recognized in the Bush White House for my efforts. But when California deregulated um, my efforts, I was the only base commander in, in the entire state of California that was able to handle an $18.2 million increase in my electric bill during that deregulation because I had saved that much in the conservation measures and the reductions and the changes by which I installed the first photovoltaic system in the Department of Defense. I converted all my non-tactical diesel vehicles to biodiesel fuel. Um, we created um, a huge water savings issue. We replaced tens of thousands of acres of what was watered land. Um, and we, I coined the phrase smartscape. Um, we got rid of all of the landscaping and we did the right thing put the right stuff in the right place so we didn't have to irrigate. It saved hundreds of millions of dollars over the years. Um, so those are the things that can happen, and they can happen individually. But I think the Navy, uh, unfortunately, under the administration, is now kind of choked. Um, but the emphasis, as you point out, um, has been going on from the strategic perspective by we who do strategy for our life um, have been doing this since the early 70s. Um, and the fact that it made the National Defense Memorandum um, under the Obama administration only affirmed um, basically 12 years of constant badgering of the administration to ensure that our national security and the concerns that Admiral Locklear brought up to the Congress were officially part of the President's Memorandum for strategic understanding of the United States and its security going forward. Um, and I believe that a very large portion of that was done by um, the Navy, um, primarily because we, those individuals um, on the Pacific theater have the greatest impact, and they're mostly Navy, Navy and Marine Corps. Thank you again. We really appreciate your, uh, you for having your program today. Thank you. Thank you. Josh, do we have our next speaker, or...? Yeah. Get the best, Jenny. Oh, Jenny! <laughs> Jenny, <laughs> welcome.
you get the morning program and the afternoon program. <laughs> I know, I know. As the state, we're very versatile, and you know, Jenny is yes. expert at that. Great. Good thing the commute is so easy. <laughs> well, welcome, Jenny. Good thank you, you thank you. Yeah, so, um, so as I mentioned this morning, Kaylee and I are in such deep conversation with each other on the Global Climate Action Summit that I'm going to put on his hat that he actually doesn't wear hats, but or at least I've never seen him in a hat. But yes, yeah, so I'll give you a little bit of background on the Global Climate Action Summit um, and, and and talk a little bit about what we're doing here at the department in, in partnership with, with ag stakeholders as well on it. So the Global Climate Action Summit, as, as I mentioned this morning, is um, going to take place in San Francisco, September 12th through the 14th. It is a chance for us as the state and the state government and the partners and the businesses and the, um, the citizens of the state to, um, to showcase the climate action that's pla taking place here in California um, and really also take a chance to renew commitments that we've made that, and, and encourage others to take commitments along with us um, as they already have, um, but find new commitments and continue the great progress that we've been making there are four or five challenge areas, and as I told the secretary, um, I should know all of the challenge areas, but I'm so focused on some of the ones that are related to us that, that those are the ones that I truly do remember. Um, there is a challenge area. I am very excited that there, there is a challenge area based on, on the land base, natural and working lands, so that encompasses the entire land base of working lands, so that's forestry, that's also agricultural land, that is um, wetlands, um, and, and I guess the, the coastal lands as well um, is, I, I'm not sure where oceans falls in that, but, um, but certainly that's a big role as well. So really looking at the land base, what are some of the commitments? The um, World Wildlife Fund is, is the lead on convening groups together to really look at what these commitments are gonna look like. Um, they're, they're the lead as far as an outside partner um, but it's all, again, being run through our governor's office and in partnership with, with the folks that we have partnered with um, throughout the world. So um, in partnership with the United Nations, in partnership with um, Mayor Bloomberg, um, as well as, as others. Um, so, so really looking at the land base is a big one. Also, this idea of, um, of economic commitments, really looking at, for us in agriculture, we're thinking about what are the purchasing powers. There are some really forward-looking companies that have made climate commitments and um, in their purchasing power of food products. So whether that is everywhere from, from Walmart to General Mills to others, um, really looking at the, the power of what they can do with their purchasing for the supply chain, how that affects um, the bottom line for the farmers and ranchers who are always um, the ones that, that end up bearing a lot of the, um, and doing a lot of the effective change on those policies. So really looking at that supply chain as a whole, what are those commitments? Um, so for California agriculture, we're looking to do a pre-event um, certainly, we will be there and we will be rallying our troops and, and raising um, a lot of awareness and continued awareness around climate smart agriculture through the main event. Um, but we will also be bringing together and pulling together our partners at the, the pre event, so September 11th and 12th in Sonoma. And this is really looking at um, showcasing or, I guess, pro projecting what we've been doing in California, at, both at the state in, in form of the investments that we've made on land conservation, on soils, on dairy digesters, on manure management, on all of those fantastic things that we have been doing here in the state. And, um, and not only looking at and exploring the things that we've been doing, but also bringing a lot of the partners that the secretary on her trips overseas with sometimes many of you guys, um, and the partnerships that we've made um, overseas as well to, to this bring them and to renew commitments and again to really look at what are the opportunities for that and then also bringing in the business partners investors folks that are really looking at things like ag technology and um, and how can we leverage investor money in a way that supports farmers who are looking to do ag technology 
bringing in the companies that are making these big commitments and the partnerships and showcasing and really exploring the partnerships that they're having directly with the farmers so that the farmers are benefiting from these climate policies as well as everyone else. So really bringing everyone together 11th and 12th in September um, and, um, and talking about climate smart agriculture as a whole. And I could take questions we're looking to do a combination of tours, panels. Um, there will be, it will be Sonoma, so there will be cheese and wine, I am sure. <laughs> That's how I sell it. <laughs> so, um, are there questions that you guys have? I got it. <laughs> so, um, just so I understand, who's the target for the September 11th and 12th session, and who's the target for the overall governor's summit mm -hmm. like who's really like who are we trying to influence and change and make sure is there in either of those two cases yeah so i think it's a combination it's definitely a chance for the folks who have really stepped up already but it's also a chance to have a platform for new people to step into that playing field as well whether they're investors who are bringing money foundations as well um so it's the the partners are the the, P, the target audience are really the champions and then also the rising champions, the people who are looking for this as the next opportunity. It's also um, a chance for, I think, us to showcase what we're doing in California to the world. Um, so it's a very much a global audience as well. It's not going to be as much of a, it certainly will have our sister states there, um, folks that are, are very much interested, but it is also a global audience. And if I could add um, something to it, you know, the governor, before he went to Peru five years ago, I, time goes by fast, they came up with this concept of the under two MOU and, and the power of that and how that captured the attention of so many um, state, city, subnational governments. Um, and it was done to try to build momentum leading into the Paris meetings. But we now have over, is it now over 200? Yes, governments that have signed on to that, that represent significant GDP, significant population. And so the governor feels like we should all come together and check in what are we truly doing and challenge ourselves collectively of what more can we do. But it's, it's kind of like a holding each other accountable kind of thing. But he's very mindful. He wants this to be about California and Californians who have played a very active role in this, um, but, but that it has to be connected to all of these folks who have made commitments. This is kind of like, so show us, well, yeah. what has it been? Yeah, this is the halfway point. That, so the Paris Climate Accord was signed in 2016, and there are the first round of real big commitments are 2020 for that. And um, so this is exactly as what Secretary Ross said. It's a chance to do a check-in, make sure we're all on progress to meet the commitments that were made or exceed them. <laughs> Karen, is this like a yearly or is this like a one-time kind of thing? No, it's, uh, well, of course, I would vote for Governor Brown again, but yeah. since he won't be governor anymore, um, um, this is, this will be, and I think, I think if I remember correctly, I wasn't in the state, but I think Governor Schwarzenegger did something similar at, at the end, just like, we're all working a way to capture all of the accomplishments and things that the department has done under some really challenging circumstances. It's a chance to just wrap up a set of time in history um, and, and hopefully hand it off so that it keeps momentum going. And, and we all know that a lot of the climate work started previously and we all wanna make sure that it doesn't end with us walking out. Well, and if I could add, too, I think it's also an opportunity. I mean, as California being the largest agricultural producer in the United States, it gives us a unique way to introduce agriculture as part of the discussion and bring farmers and ranchers to the table as part of the larger climate change discussions that occur. Because a lot, as some of the presentations that we've heard in the past, have focused on land use or food waste, but they aren't really connecting to the farmers and ranchers or are on the ground on a daily basis, you know, caring and being stewards for the environment and the contributions they make for sustainability and the environment. So I think trying to build that nexus that's kind of missing in a lot of the climate change discussions is something that we're aiming for as well. Mm -hmm. 
and it's funny because I am on my way to Panama on the 60th. I'm going to Panama for the uh, development, International Development Bank, and it's about climate change. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because it's about the farmer. So they have put that angle in the Americas from Mexico down on the farmer, not on the, the climate change, yes, but how is the farmer and the human being connected to this whole climate change, which has always been interesting to me, is hearing climate change is climate change there. Right. And it's the first time that I'm starting to hear, and I just hear you, Josh, because it's what they did. Mm -hmm. So I'll be speaking there, but it's interesting that it's the farmer, the core. So I, you know, not to revisit a great presentation that was made, but when you look at poverty and hunger on a global basis, it's dominated um, by very small subsidence farmers and they're not able to feed their families and climate change is accelerating that spiral down. So understanding the impacts to farmers as well as the opportunities farmers have to keep a sustainable farming system or grazing system, whatever it is, is hugely, is hugely important for all these other issues that we talked about a few moments ago. So yeah, there's the macro global trade, but there's also this ability what we can learn and share with one another about how to feed our families and how to do it. The old way was, well, use that land all up. So we just kept broadening the footprint, which is a huge part of the problem that we have now. What can we do by improving the practices on the ground to continue to feed the family and keep the footprint the same or smaller? Um, and we have, I, I happen to be very chauvinistic about California. We have the capacity in California when you look at intellectually the, the world's best scientists and the venture capital that's here. We have the capacity to do this here and our farms are also very, very diverse. We have very, very small to very, very large, the efficiencies that come from that, but the biodiversity that we can do. California, it's not that we can preach to the world because we've learned a lot from our climate smart ag delegations around the world. But we have a lot of capacity here, and, and I happen to believe with you, sir, that uh, we must pay it forward. We are here because of what others did for us, hopefully not to us. But right now, I feel like when I go and speak to FFA students and 4-H kids, it's like, I'm really sorry what we're handing you. And we have the capacity to give them the tools as well. Sorry for the soapbox. Yeah, and I think this conversation, just to add on to that, is exactly the kind of conversations that we look to have. So we're hoping to have not only different conversations on procurement and what a sustainable procurement look like and how can we, um, through the supply chain, um, affect change, but also through public policy, also directly um, have a farmer panel. Um, so often we all have a lot of <laughs> policy people talk. So yeah, really, really hear from not only the challenges but also the opportunities. Joy, I, I just wanted to make mention. Did everybody see the story in the Sunday Times magazine two weeks ago? The dirt. The dirt. Yeah. Dirt will yep. save the planet. Dirt, dirt will save, save the planet, and how farming practices will that carbon sequestration is probably one of the most promising answers that we have right now. And so it is exciting to be at the forefront um, of what can be done, is being done. Yeah. To follow up, each of you have a copy of the breakthrough study. Read it on the way home. Well, no. And we're depending, <laughs> no, not, God no, knows. sorry, we're on the plane. <laughs> but I think that, uh, you know, one of the resources we have is all the wisdom of our farming and ranching community. And if we know the direction we need to go, uh, to use that uh, with, with more focus so that we have practical on the ground, this is how it can be done, uh, expertise. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah. Prish, Jenny really appreciate uh, filling in there. The cow can't drink. <laughs> so, thank you again. We had already wrapped up our meeting. Oh, so. good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, that wraps up our speakers for the day. Did you want to add something now or a little bit later? Well.
Um, I think this is another great panel. As we know, Josh always does a great job of getting speakers and keeping them on point. Um, but I know oftentimes, and we have a little bit of time today, so I'm going to bring this. Oftentimes, people go, but what can we or should we be doing with everything we've heard today? Um, always trying to think about, you know, we are advisory. We, I'm sorry, I'm not on this board and haven't been for nine years, but I used to be for a very long time. But, but I, I often hear people, you know, they want to fulfill that advisory role that, that the board was established for before there was a department. So always thinking about if there's a nugget that comes out of this that you want to flush into creating yet another forum like you did so successfully with the groundwater recharge forum that we did in November or some specific recommendations that you want to send to the governor and myself. I always want to make sure that you know you, you should all say, throw up the microphone and say, this is something today that we would like to, to approach in that way. So I just wanted to remind you of that. And then since I brought up the groundwater thing, yeah. I, I've really been bugging um, the president. Um, there's a couple of openings now on the water subcommittee, um, but we really, um, the administration would really love to get the final recommendations that came out of the groundwater forum in, in November. Um, we're very mindful of the tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock that we're all facing. So um, I'm hopeful that you'll follow up on that, too, because the uh, recommendations in the draft report are in your folder. Thanks. Thank you, Secretary Ross. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. President. <laughs> no, thanks, Karen. Yeah, and that's something that I wanted to discuss, too. You know, I, what, I, what I did, I asked Josh if he could put uh, an item on the end of our programs, and hopefully we'll have this continue in the future. And what I'd like to do is open it up to bring up uh, the opportunity for making recommendations to the secretary and the governor um, on issues that we've been talking about. Uh, and I'd also like to change the water committee around a little bit. And uh, I've talked to uh, both Bryce and to Don Bransford, and I'd like to make Don Bransford the, uh, the chairman for the committee. And then we also have a few vacancies, and if you guys will give me a short amount of time to get that, get those changed out, um, we'd like to do that, and then would really like them be able to uh, complete the groundwater uh, tasks that we have in front of us. And maybe if you could give the committee the authorization to sign off on a final. Uh, uh, Final, I think we, yeah, we have a yep. Any, on the final report, uh, Josh, you got yeah, a comment let me provide on, some on procedure for that? Yeah, let me provide some context for the board. Sure. So um, as you recall, a majority of us participated in kind of doing a ground, managed groundwater recharge conference back in November of last year. We had about 100 stakeholders. I have kind of the information on the program all put within your materials. Um, since that time, um, I have been able to work at a staff level, level with very, with some of my colleagues across agencies to kind of put together um, a list of recommendations that are kind of included within your packet here. And I was also able to um, reach out to some of the key board members who were instrumental in bringing together our conference, and also some of our key external stakeholders were instrumental in bringing their conference together and incorporated their kind of comments here as well as in terms of track changes. I'm, I'm fairly confident that from a staff perspective, that we're definitely in kind of the right direction in terms of bringing together some. I just see Mark Carlson is trying to sneak out of the room. And I wanted to acknowledge Mark um, because he's retiring. There's a rumor he's retiring. But he has been the head of uh, Lutheran Policy Office here in the Sacramento region for a number of years. He's worked very hard over the last decade to make sure that there's always a forum on climate change. And I was afraid that he might sneak out and not come back to any more of our state board meetings. So, Mark, thank you for all your hard work. Sorry, I interrupted Josh. No, so, I mean, I think from a process standpoint, I know this is maybe the first time that few of the board members have had a chance to look at this. But I think um, I'm kind of comfortable from a staff perspective of where we're at, and I think my colleagues and other agencies are comfortable. But I, and I think that a motion uh, from the board that maybe designates the president to finalize the recommendations with staff 
and to be able to forward those recommendations on to the secretary and governor would be appropriate at this time. And if there is a need for additional input, maybe um, we could set a timeline for that input to come to Don before that is finalized or come to staff before that is finalized. I would recommend that, but I know that Nancy had a question. I just wanted to ask the process for moving it forward. <laughs> so move. <laughs> okay, we, uh, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? So moved. Excellent. But uh, like I say, any recommendations uh, moving forward? Uh, also subject matter. Um, you know, we, we have, uh, I don't know if you have it. I, gosh, where is it? We have too much paper. I have Josh, too many papers here. Too Cal California Ag Vision that uh, we, Josh, do you want to speak so, on that so for I a moment? To kind of again circle back and following on the secretary's remarks, this board, Yes, um, we have not been um, very vocal on like every single occasion in terms of making a recommendation to the governor every one of our 12 meetings per year. But I think when we do weigh in, we have had um, significant progress in terms of how those letters are received by the administration. And I also think that for the last couple of years, we've had some significant events that um, continue to lay a foundation for the board to take action. Uh, two years ago, um, we had the third iteration of the Ag Vision where we had about a 60, you know, a group of 60 ag stakeholders, which were, again, leadership around the state really coming together and saying, here's the priorities of what we need to do and focused on five key areas to kind of move forward and put that task back on the board. And we actually have board champions to kind of move those issues forward. So as a board, we have specific areas that we can work on and to move forward on that are recommendations from our stakeholders and kind of a direction for us. Um, last year, we had the Groundwater Forum, which, again, provided recommendations that we're now moving forward. So I think we have been very effective in kind of moving the process forward and definitely in terms of um, involvement and your voice in that. Um, we continue to be completely open to any suggestions you have, and these are the opportunities like today, right now, and at every board meeting to make those recommendations of what our future meetings could be or what those future actions could be. Well, well put, Josh. I appreciate that. <laughs> Are you getting ready to say something, Mark? Well, I think so. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, so, uh, I, so this is the part of the agenda where we can talk about what recommendations we have for the secretary. And the that, that is correct. And, and I'd like, <laughs> yeah, I'd really, okay. I'd like to make it a part, a part of every yeah. meeting that we have so that if That's we right want to move it. forward on well, something, so, we have the ability to do it. Um, yeah. Um, so r with regard to today's agenda, um, I, I want to say this in the sort of most nonpartisan way possible, but, um, you know, I feel like I, I, I think our governor in, in, in a couple of cases has, you know, uh, boldly, uh, you know, sort of put down a mark at a national level on issues that were important to California and to, to him. Um, I think on trade, you know, I, 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 this is a personal view, and I would put it out for the board to discuss, but I, sort of, I feel like the uh, policies that are being promoted at the federal level are short-sighted. They're grounded in ignorance and not um, on, on good analysis of data. They're harmful to California agriculture. They're harmful to um, you know, job creation in California. I just think they're wrong. And so I, I don't know. I haven't been paying attention to what the governor said about trade. Um, but I guess my recommendation would be that this board make a fairly strong statement, um, you know, asking the governor to, to weigh in um, on, on, on these trade policies, which I think are, are, are harmful to California and, and, agri and California agriculture. Right. Under Secretary McKinney told us essentially that uh, – these trade policies uh, may be hurtful, they may be harmful in the short run, but our kids and our grandkids would be able to, would, would be thanking us. And to me, it's like, well, we may not be farming yes. um, if we don't get through the next few years and with all the other issues we have. But If I made a follow on that, and I think, and it was a challenge of putting together this agenda because we had Under Secretary McKinney here to kind of offer the administrative perspective, so it was hard to kind of loop in for a two-week period. But um, we did invite board members to attend that um, opportunity and had 
the administration's position laid out, which actually does make is a strong case. And so there is a counterpoint to some of the discussions that we've heard, and I know that Casey mentioned that as well, but there is a str there is an argument, and a valid argument, in terms of the trade arena. Right, and, and also we were told to, um, if we had any questions, that we could reach out to Under Secretary McKinney, um, which I thought was very helpful. If, if I could... Um weigh in the the governor is very judicious and where he weighs in and where he believes there is a role for the state and he's very mindful that international trade agreements are the purview of the federal government and he's very respectful of that and that um, even in the state of california um, there are many people there's there's just a very strong anti-trade sentiment in the country and there is one in california so there are many uh, differing points of view about what those should look like. But I can tell you that I think it is very important for you all as members of the state board to be able to provide him input of, of what the current situation um, presents and the challenge that that adds to the future of agriculture because we are unique in what we grow and the markets that we send it to. And I think it would be, I think it would be very appropriate, and I think it's, I think it's a good time to be able to provide that kind of input for him to, to hear it directly from you all. Well, um, Crystal brought it up earlier. One of the biggest issues that I hear repeatedly is that what we're essentially exporting is water in terms of internal California antipathy to trade and so it seems to me that that is something that we really can counter if we particularly talk about how we're encouraging farmers to make better use of their water that that is more important than saying no you cannot grow almonds we're taking away your almonds instead it's what should we be doing as a state to further incentivize the farmers to have the best possible practice in terms of water use. Just turn the conversation has to be completely turned around, in my opinion. Frank, go ahead. My question I didn't quite understand. You did the, the end of your, we have to turn the conversation around how? So that instead of saying, uh, we don't want to export water through almonds, but what we want to make the conversation about is how the farmers need to be doing a better and better job of managing the water as a resource so that that is not the issue. D did I explain that? Yeah, the, you know, the Almond Board has actually tackled that fairly successfully. And uh, I know I heard ads on the radio in uh, San Francisco and, and other areas talking about the water efficiency that the almond growers have moved toward over the last, I don't know if it was 10, 20 years, but uh, no, it, it, you're right, it, it's an issue. I mean, I think virtually we probably import a lot more water than we export, but uh, you know, on a virtual scale, but I know that it's been discussed and the almond board has been on top of that and maybe they need to do more. If I could follow up, Eric, I appreciate your comments over there. Um, but uh, I agree that it w we should send a message. And, and we, what I keep hearing is is we, there's fair uh, and reciprocal trade is kind of the, the buzzword that's going on. And I don't think that anybody's going to disagree with that. Um, but I do think that there's a huge impact to California if, if we don't send a message. And I think that um, I was fortunate to have Secretary McKinney out to my farm, and he did reach out and say, if you guys have any comments that you'd like to, to send to me directly, please reach out to me, because I'm open. That's why I'm here. And I think that in some respects, we may be preaching to the choir, because I think he agrees with us more than he disagrees with us. But I do think it would be important for us to say, given, in light of the fact that you came to visit us, here's what we believe as a, as a board. And if if I may, um, kind of as another opportunity that came from the McKinney visit um, with um, the department and with stakeholders was uh, definitely kind of the invitation to have the USTR um, Ag representative come out to California. So I mean, that's something that the board could also encourage as well, is maybe inviting the um, Greg Dowd the, to come out 
Ag Ambassador and USGR to negotiate with. We sent that before he was, I think it was right before he was appointed, but we could follow up, yeah. Mike? Well, we're talking about, about future programs and, you know, it seems like we've had a, several programs related to water sort of separately. I mean, the groundwater and, and uh, uh, we've heard from the agencies as to what's happened in the past. And my question is whether or not we shouldn't have a program that may need to be a two-day program, but a program that's sort of all-encompassing because we have a really a fairly diverse board uh, with, with various interests and, you know, putting together all of the possibilities, reclamation, uh, uh, conservation, uh, you know, uh, certainly the groundwater uh, should be revisited, uh, surface water storage, uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things that seems to me that need to be covered and, and whereas we normally have a, a smaller audience it might be something that we could attract a larger audience to get more input from people outside of the board. Uh, and my thought was that maybe the, the water committee could sort of put together a potential program to the secretary to get, see if the, she agrees with uh, the idea. Thanks, Mike. Yes, Jeff. So I'm the new guy, so forgive me. Um, but I, I have a question, and maybe you guys have covered it in the past, or how do we look at it going forward? But I think I mentioned to you earlier, and I'm fighting with it today and yesterday, but this um, groundwater contamination, 123 TCP, and how it affects food and ag in California, is that something that's been talked about in depth? Because, I mean, you know, I've had four or five phone calls from the major distributor, you know, Costco. Walmart, Whole Foods, all these guys, while well, we've been sitting right here asking about that because all of a sudden it, it came kind of to the forefront yesterday. Could you explain a little more for the rest of the board? So does everybody oh, know does, about one, does two, he three, have TCP? to? Don't make him drag his back. <laughs> I can talk real quickly about um, one, two, three, TCP and how it's affecting the groundwater throughout California and central, especially the Central Valley. Um, you know, this was a, a product that uh, contaminated groundwater 30 years ago, and now with water testing and, and state limits of five parts per trillion, it's affecting the drinking water. Everyone had to test their water and their wells um, by the end of um, March. Then you had to post to all of your employees if your water was contaminated or not. And, uh, you know, there's 560 wells contaminated up and down the valley. We happen to have had one of them in our facility, which we remedied by putting um, bottled water out, but now it's going further with our customers saying, how's that affect your, your crops? How's it affect your process water and all that? So, it, I, yeah. exactly. So I, I didn't know how it was being addressed with in that. Je Jeff, I think, I think it's a very timely issue because the state has just passed a set of recommendations um, and regulations, how we increase the use of recycled water. And so the question has come up, as you know, again, from the Southern San Joaquin and the Central Valley Board has a committee looking specifically at um, produced water from, from the oil and gas sector. But it has come up more and more as people wonder, can you really use recycled water from from the wastewater treatments in, of the cities, even though it's being treated two and three times, which is an ironic question to ask because it's not just desalinization that they're using in Israel and Saudi Arabia. 85% of their water is recycled water. So we keep, you know, it seems like it would have been something that the, the answers are there. We could succinctly put it out there and have it done. I'm not convinced it's as clear or as updated with contemporary information as it should be. And as part of a water discussion, skipping over the use of recycled water and all the ways that it can be done and be very safe 
for food production, I think is a very timely topic for something not just the one that you've run into now. Um, before we, I wanted to circle back to um, Mike's uh, comment. And Mike, I didn't know if you actually wanted to make a motion for that in terms of the water committee, to have them recommend that and develop something for the secretary. Okay. Well, I would love for us to um, revisit SB 623, because I'm concerned. Um, this is the affordable, safe drinking water, and I'm concerned um, about its timeline, and, um, and that it seems to be more of an uphill battle than it, than it should have been. So um, the framework of SB 623, which is safe drinking water, um, which in includes some new fees on agriculture for covering um, nitrate-impacted drinking water systems and a small fee on all urban um, uses, um, has been incorporated into a trailer bill. And the timing on trailer bills, um, it, the normal way is with the budget or shortly after the budget is passed, trailer bills um, are then taken up. Sometimes there is a gap in that. Um, it is not yet clear what the timing on this one will be. Um, there are, there's over 100 organizations that are supporting that, but there's still very strong um, resistance and opposition from the water agencies. So um, it's, it's a top priority for the administration. Having it as part of uh, trailer bill language helps it, but it is not the answer to it. It's still the work of getting one vote at a time and getting bipartisan votes. And that's where the focus needs to be. Normally, June 30th, it would all be done. But there's no way of saying that for sure to share. The budget will be done, but not all the trailer bills may be taken up exactly then. Is there anything that um, we as a board can do to help move that along? Um, we, we should discuss uh, timing. It could be a letter of support to the author could be an option. Um, we usually just have to do a check-in. Um, across the street, but that could be an option, and we're happy to explore that. Certainly, you have uh, two months, so you, if, you, if you didn't take that up at this meeting and did at the beginning of June, it's still ample time. Uh, do you, Go ahead, Ashley. Karen, do, do you think that, my impression is that, generally speaking, agriculture is backing that bill now. And actually, our issue is really more urban water agencies. So, um, thanks to the good work of like Kern and Tulare and other farm bureaus, um, some of the ag irrigation districts have now come on to support. Um, a number of the local chamber of commerces have come in to support. Um, so, to get a bipartisan vote, and especially one out of the Central Valley will require that kind of approach one county at a time. And then there are about 14 urban members who don't have any of the disadvantaged drinking water systems in their districts, even though they're all around them. Um, that that are, are, is one of the challenges. And then it's for urban districts who are worried about their affordability issues already that are concerned about going up on this as a two-thirds vote when they've got their own local 218 issues going on. So it's a combination of all of the above. Just to ask, because I'm wondering if there's more, I, I'm not, a, a support letter to the author, I'm not sure is going to move the needle. But the author could share that with others. Okay. Yeah. One thought, um, in case we can't send a letter to 
all members of the legislature. Would there be maybe a way we could uh, know which other irrigation districts or water agencies in the valley or haven't yet come in support that we might do some targeted outreach? Right now I'd say it's more of them that haven't. There's a very small handful that have. What about, a, what about approaching the county ag um, leaders, county by county? Well, that would be uh, farm bureaus. Um, not all local farm bureaus have taken a position, but increasingly a number of them have. Um, and the state board, the state farm bureau board um, asked each county to take up the issue for their discussions at the state level um, just last week. Um, so I think that process is happening, yes. Um, especially in the, in the Valley, the local Farm Bureau chapters are very well respected because they really have a good grasp on what the issues are, both locally as well as some of the state priorities. Well, this is actually a new topic. <laughs> But, um, well, not new, because I, I seem to just always be bringing it up. But, you know, um, we have in the past, it's been maybe one or two years that we've talked about um, broadband. Oh. And, um, and it's going to be uh, almost impossible for precision farming to fix the problems if we can't upload and download the information. So I do have a suggestion. Um, we have not had the USDA executive officers for FSA and rural development um, here yet, and they were named at the first of the year. And Kim Van is the rural development director. This would be a great opportunity for them to be here. Secretary Perdue announced last week another new round of funding, and it is the number one priority at USDA. Um, there's more money in the farm bill, but who knows how the farm bill is going to go. But more importantly, the tax bill included um, a thing called opportunity zones, which is a way for folks who have capital gains to be able to make local investments in opportunity zones to get um, some of the, it's part of the trade-offs of some of the things they're losing. So California went through a public process. We have 879 designated opportunity zones. And I have put broadband number one on the list of places for folks with, who are interested in making investments. So it could be a combination, kind of a rural development, understanding what opportunity zones are, what their opportunities are for that, and the need for broadband for ag technology it could be a combo. Right, I, I was at a meeting yesterday uh, Mr. Gore, and uh, really the, the program was pretty much geared toward the future of agriculture, innovation, technology, but broadband to connect everything. And uh, I was pretty impressed with some of the presentations that we had yesterday. So maybe we can, maybe Josh, we can focus one meeting on, uh, on broadband and ag technology and how they need to come together here in California and, and, and what's being done currently. Yes, right there. So the merge between Sprint and T-Mobile, if you watch the two CEOs talking, 20% uh, was about the merger and 80% was about rural America. How much the 5G is going to go into and what they're going to invest and how much they're going to put into, into the investment. I think, and I really will emphasize this, that we should bring CPUC to the conversation mm -hmm. because they are the ones who hold the key to these corporations to come into the state and invest. Uh, so when they ask for more things, CPUC will hold them to the fire. And if we, as rural uh, talk from California, then they will listen to it. Yes. And, and we have somebody who's sitting from Central Valley in a CPUC appointed by governor. We, we, uh, I was going to say, a co-bank should be invited to this because they would like to make more investments here and they don't always have the right structure for that. So I think they could also be a good one. Well, we heard the presentation yesterday. If they can put... Uh, broadband in Africa for $2 per person to sign up. I, I don't know why we can't do something here in California. Yeah, to that end, I, I would love to have um, somebody from Google here to explain why they do it in Mexico, Indonesia, and India, but not here. And, and part of that might be regulatory issues too that they run into here. Don't, don't know, but uh, 
Well, it's that's why it'd be great to have CPUC and and a Google, and then that would give you an amazing announcement in September. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Josh, so, pardon? Ah, sorry. Um, um, the Rear Admiral's comments also just raised for me. I don't know if this is even a possibility. It's a blue sky idea, but um, it does seem to me that there are a lot of folks in the Valley who are, in, who are very interested in ag investing, um, very interested in impact investing and sort of having a positive. Uh, but part of the challenge is they still get stuck at expecting the companies they're investing in to turn a profit in a year to two to three years. So, I mean, I, it, would it be possible to even, um, you know, invite some of them to put a small pot or even maybe not so small a pot of money and say, let's have a pitch fest that is, you know, the 50-year pitch fest, right? You only have to do one thing, but just to stretch their minds to thinking about what does it look like to invest in real innovation that is not bound by having just this company make quarterly profits within the next year to two years. What would that, you know, look like? Particularly, obviously, focusing in the agriculture sector. But I, I think this is, you know, it's just a. St I spent a lot of time with impact investors, and it's just a stumbling block that, you know, if you really want to make transformative change, you have to unleash your mind from that mindset because that's not where moonshots come from. So. Thank you, Crystal. Any other comments? I had a question on the TCP. The companies contacted you about that. Were they concerned that the TCP is in the food product? They are. That's what they're. That's what the customers are concerned about. It's their right. it's the social media. Yeah. But there's no there's no research on it actually being. <laughs> So I'll tell you, just from our standpoint, we haven't found any research or anything that shows it going into the food. It's a drinking water issue, and it's a drinking water problem, but now all of a sudden these, it's a, a perception issue, and so now all of a sudden these big companies are saying maybe we shouldn't be buying produce from California or from Southern California because it could possibly be either in the food or in the rinse water. And all this happened yesterday due to an article that got... And I mean, it's, I've had lots of calls already this morning and last night, and mm -hmm. it's, it's just catching a lot of steam. And, and the talk is now another, uh, another um, testing uh, and report, another report for like a food safety kind of thing. So it's more expense on the farmer now. So do we have any other comments? So are we going to act on that? And I say because I heard that yesterday too, and they are talking about now maybe asking us for another compliance, uh, another one for farmers. Uh, so my question if, is... If I could, I think it's very important to put this in the context of the California Water Action Plan, which has a heavy, heavy emphasis on using recycled water and the safety of using recycled water and groundwater um, to meet all of our food safety standards. I'd hate to isolate this to this and putting very valuable family names through something that we don't need to add to that, but it is part of the larger discussion because we're seeing uh, the, the concerns about using recycled water and and in general and what's happening at the Central Valley Board, which is a two-year process already of doing that evaluation. So if we could identify true research gaps that could answer this in a timely basis, that would be great, whatever it might be. But I think we need to think, we need we can't just be about right. one incident that piles on to the one, sorry, Jeff, but I'm just... No, I'm <laughs> yep. Right, um, right, yeah. yeah. So that that's why I think Mike laying out all the things in water, we have a California Water Action Plan, it's in its seventh year, um, and it includes everything. One of, one of Eric's favorite topics is what we do in the headwaters and the forests is also about water and it would touch on each one of these and I think that would be a powerful two-day meeting and you could put that anywhere but it would be great to do something maybe with UC Merced or Bakersfield you know CSU you know whatever it might be right so so to summarize what we've heard so far 
we'd like to, if I understand the board correctly, we'd like to do a letter um, back to the deputy undersecretary or the undersecretary of ag um, in regard to international trade and also invite the USTR to visit California, maybe in the same in the same letter, but to make sure we pass along the understanding that uh, these tariffs are serious and growers are concerned, uh, that California is in the position of exporting its crops, and that this does affect uh, individual farms and families throughout California. Uh, we also, uh, Mike's suggestion about a comprehensive water forum, something uh, we can put together. Uh, we'll, I think uh, maybe Josh, you can see what we can do about putting something together in the future. And then the other issue was the AB uh, 623, possible letter to either the author or to uh, legislators across the uh, across the street. A letter to the governor stressing the importance of trade for California agriculture. Yes. And connect the dots to the yep. other jobs that are created. Exactly. Thank you. So well, does give you guys thirty minutes and look what you come up with. Wow. Pretty amazing. <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> really. No, that is, and, and really, that that's what we'd like to see. Um, if we have issues that we need to address, the last one was uh, six six twenty three. So, do we need a motion for you to move forward on these? By consensus. Yes. For all three? I'll move it. Then. Joy, second. All of the above. All of the above. Okay, we have That's a motion. Sufficient. We have a second. second. Joy. Right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 So moved. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, uh, that should do it for today. We are adjourned, and thank you all. Good to see everybody again, and have a safe, safe travel home. I just wanted to add my welcome to Jeff. And to Frank on your second meeting, you're a veteran now. <laughs>